Well, welcome to The Times, Sandy, um, for this uh, botanical interview. And the first thing I want to say is um, hearty congratulations on your FRS. Thank um, you. And uh, delighted to, to see that. And I wondered if you could um, tell us a bit about that. What does this, this FRS and the Royal Society mean to you? Well, it was a bit of a shock, to be perfectly honest, to be made an FRS was an incredible shock. I mean, I knew someone had nominated me, but I just thought, no, nah, this is never going to happen. You know how you do. And um, what I think is what I think is great about it is I was the only plant person in my entire cohort of all the people who were admitted this year. And so for me, the Royal Society is in a way a, a platform um, from which we can talk about about the importance of plants in the environment, the importance of plants generally, but also the importance of taxonomy and the importance of that basic understanding of 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 life on Earth. That's 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 beyond, you know, kind of little tiny mechanisms of how things work. It's not that those aren't important, but it's a but it's another platform from which to kind of um, talk about what we think is important. Absolutely fantastic. That's great. Um, and I'm sure you'll do that. Uh, brilliantly. I hope so. I plans. hope so. <laughs> yes. Yeah. OK, um, so moving on, um, you were one of the chairs for Botanical University Challenge 2022. Um, did you have a highlight? What was your highlight of Botanical University mm. Challenge 2022? Highlight. Oh, golly. Highlight. That's a really hard one. A highlight. A highlight of that amazing event is really hard one. I think. I was just gobsmacked by the by the number of different things people knew and 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 the kind of the ways in which the ways in which they express themselves about plants. But the thing I think that struck me the most of all was the way some of the teams um, shared their knowledge with each other and came up with those answers together. And for me, that's a really important thing about science is we don't do it on our own. We're not an individual who knows lots and lots of things. What we are is a group of people who share our knowledge and come up with an answer for something. And and I and I was so impressed with with the teams who 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 really did that, who really kind of consulted with one another and chatted about what the answer was. And somebody said something and then somebody said, well, no, but then they talked about it a bit. And I just I was so impressed with their interaction, I suppose, yeah. um, it, even more than their botanical knowledge. It was with the with the way in which they interacted with each other, which is really how how botany should be, but how science should be in general. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's why we're very keen on that team aspect, but also Botanical University Challenge as a vehicle to, to help connect um, plant aware students all, all over the country and, and ultimately mm -hmm. maybe internationally. We'll see where we go with that. But thanks very much. Yeah. OK, you're president of the Linnaean Society. So what did your role there entail? Well, I actually finished that in May. So my yeah. my, my term ended in May and um, my role as president, I mean, the president doesn't didn't really before I started didn't really have a job description and there wasn't a very um, yeah the role didn't really have a job description but essentially what the president is there to do is to boost for the Linnaean Society and make sure that people understand what the Linnaean Society is for but it's also to lead council in making strategic decisions and thinking about the strategic direction of the society and how we can best use the society to um, to kind of to, to better support that vision of a world where nature is understood and valued and, and protected, really. So we, well, during my term as president, we revisited the mission and the vision and the values, you know, all that kind of governance stuff, which, which institutions do all the time, which on the face of it sounds super boring, but actually it provides that, that solid bedrock that you know what you're for, you know what, and you know how to articulate it, and you can go forward and really ensure that how you spend your your money, which is given to you by members and from publishing, you know, how you spend your money is best deployed to actually achieve that vision. So by having all of that as an underpinning, um, that that's a lot of what I did while I was the president was was do the governance. But you also get to chair meetings all the time and and, you know, kind of meet amazing people. And the fellows of the Linnaean Society are a terrific bunch. I mean, they come from all walks of life and are fascinating and all completely passionate about the natural world. Brilliant, brilliant. Uh, you work at the Natural History Museum. So can you give us a flavor? Can you describe <laughs> impossible I'm sure an average day well <laughs> and you're my kind of best average day or my worst average day I mean, oh, you know, there's, give us both. Of, there's give one us of both. each there's one of each <laughs> so so both. my best average day is is 
one of the great things about working at the museum is you get to walk in and go through that amazing hall with the amazing architecture and the amazing whale and you just feel like oh goody you know here i am every single day but you know my best my best day is a day is a day when i you know you always have a few meetings you have to go to and you have to you know there's there's stuff you're doing but and 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 those are great because what you're doing is creating something together with your colleagues whether it be a you know a big project like um reforming the gardens and the urban nature project outside the museum's front or whether it's kind of talking about how we're going to address issues at cop 15 or you know all that other stuff but but my best day <laughs> And this often starts after everyone else has gone home is when I can get into the herbarium and get into my specimens and really start to tease out, figure out the next group of Solanaceae that I'm working on. And I just look at specimens and I measure things and I look at stuff and I think, you know, is this, you know, what do I think about this? Oh, this might be this. And I, I, I love I love comparative. I mean, taxonomy is nothing but comparative biology. That's all it is. It's just comparative biology. And I love looking at specimens, not only for the plants that are pressed on them, but also for the stories that are in the labels, the stories about those people who went those places at that time. So I often get distracted and go off down various tangents. But um, but I, I one of my, uh, a very good day for me is one that I can spend at least some time looking at specimens. That, that's lovely. And I think there you you talked before about all the meetings that, 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 that are important in, in the different organisations. But now you're talking about the herbarium, how important collections are for science. And also, of course, you do field work. And, and the next question is is about Solanaceae. You mentioned that you work on Solanaceae. You've travelled the globe to find them. Um, tell us about the Solanaceae, um, what, um, why they're important and, and, and why they why they make you go ding. Well, Solanaceae are the total best because of all plant families, they are used for food, for medicine, for drugs and for horticulture. So they're incredibly useful to us as people. So one of the stories about Solanaceae, one of the great things about working with Solanaceae is it always has to do with pe it often. Well, usually has to do with people. So it's about people and plants and how they intersect. And then um, so a lot of my research has been on my research is basic taxonomy. So what I do is is I revise groups, I monograph groups of things, I figure out what the species are, I write species descriptions, I do lots of, of nomenclature stuff, figuring out the types of things, which is which is like bibliographical archaeology. You know, you just kind of dig into the literature further and further and try to figure things out. It's kind of fun. It's like a, it's like a treasure hunt. But then also I do phylogenetics to look at the relationships of things. And so and so with those two things together. And I think those two things need to go together. But doing phylogeny without doing the taxonomy part, the revisionary monographic part, all you have is a tree. You don't have something that tells you about variation. You don't have something that tells you about circumscription. You don't have something that tells you about all the other names that are out there that might not be something you want to use. So those two things are, are really important to go together. And so I've done revisions of things like, with, with always with colleagues, I almost always do things as as a group as you know i'm quite a collaborative person but but i um i almost always do my monographs with other people and i've done monographs of of tomatoes and and um you know various other groups of selenums and i'm just involved right now in just finishing which is incredibly painful and because the finishing anything you know it's all the fun bits finished you know the bit of figuring out what the species are and and where they occur and how you tell them apart that's all done and now it's all about kind of making sure all the supplementary material is right and nothing's misspelled and you know all that which takes almost as long almost <laughs> as long as doing the fun bit so and then i've got a couple other ones on the on the boil in the back burner which as soon as this one's done then they'll go Lovely. so I, I i sort of had an aim you know a long time ago in the early 2000s i had a name uh with colleagues all over the world to to selenum is one of the selenum is the biggest genus in the solanaceae so it's half the family and it is one of the biggest genera of flowering plants. So there's about 15 or 20 genera that have more than a thousand species, and they make up more than 10% of all of angiosperm diversity, which is pretty extraordinary. So I guess what I've been driven by the whole time is why, why are there so many species? Why are there so many species of selenum? But to, to answer that question, or even to get close to answering that question, you need to know what the species are and where they occur and what traits they have and all that other stuff that comes from that basic taxonomic work. 
So we had an aim in the early 2000s to basically create a text, a, a whole a global monograph of selenium to get everything at the same level, you know, revised by more or less the same people. So we could actually start to answer that kind of stuff. So it's it's fun. I've branched off into other genera as well, though. But that but it's but Solanaceae is absolutely fantastic. Thank you, thank you. Um, and I'm loving the way we're getting out the um, here the stories. I always think stories, but also the people. And I absolutely agree with you. Um, I have sometimes tended to focus and tended to say things like, well, the plant, it's all about the plants. But actually, I remember being told by Steve Blackmore that actually it's also about the people, the botanists um, and the stories. Of, but it's of also them about the, the well local the people, plants. the local people who yes, use these plants and have and, and, and the interesting and the, one of the really interesting things. I mean, I can remember a trip I did in China once with um, with my colleague um, Jin Shu Wang and, and her husband um, Gao. And we went on this extraordinary journey. We went from um, from um, Weishu and we went all along the border of Vietnam and then down and onto Hainan Island and then went back to Beijing. But but we sort of collected eggplant wild relatives all along there and 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 talked to people in all these mm -hmm. villages about these plants. And and of course, I couldn't speak Chinese. But Jin Shu could. And so, and, and so we just he, just hearing how people interact with these with plants and think think about them. And the same is true with potatoes in Peru is people have very close relationships with plants, which we in our very urbanized societies or European. I don't know what it is, whether it's urban or 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 consumer led or whatever it is, but we tend not to have that that relationship with plants where we know them as individuals and as as um, as beings that are on the same that are, yes. are the same worth as us. Yes. And I think that's one of the great joys of field work is talking not just to other botanists, but actually to all kinds of people really important and I, I think your point there is I think we did have it I think I think we've lost it mm. because we've lost that connection with the earth we, we, we buy stuff from shops and the young generation allegedly doesn't know you know where milk comes from and the like um, well that's yeah. one of the really important things about the natural history museum is that is that's one of the things that 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 the museum is doing is is looking looking at at creating those advocates for the planet which means you you do kind of think about where things come from and, and, and yes. stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you may have answered this question um, a bit with your, your story about your, your Chinese adventures, but um, what is your most standout or another standout field work story? Oh, man, I just had so much fun in the field. I just have such a good time in the field. I just love it. Um, I've had I've had some kind of um, exciting accidents. I've had times when people were very angry with me. Um, I've had times when I've been quite ill. Uh, but I, I guess I'll tell you the one about the passion flower because I collected. So when I was a graduate student, so I was a PhD student and, you know, PhDs are supposed to be like, no, 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 you're full on. Well, I took a year off from my PhD in the middle of my PhD and I went and I collected plants for the Missouri Botanical Garden in Panama, which is part of how I got to know a lot of tropical tropical plant families and stuff is because I wasn't just working on selenium, you know, the thing I was doing my PhD on. I was I had to collect everything and I didn't have to identify it. But, you know, if you're out there, you might as well. And so um, we were collecting in a place called the Rio Guanche in Panama. And we'd gone up the Rio Guanche and I and I was interested in passiflores because my partner at the time was w working on butterflies that ate passiflores. Mm -hmm. And and I was walking by the river and I saw this flower floating down in the river. And it was a passiflora that was unlike any other passiflora I'd ever seen in Panama before is absolutely amazing it was like a huge kind of spidery white thing just big you know gorgeous and i thought well if it's in the river it has to be coming from upstream so i got into the river which is up to about my mid thighs my waist you know kind of and waded up the river until i found the the, the tree that was that was um that was hanging over and then I found a man, because I'm really rubbish at trees, I, I, I fall out of trees. So I, we found a man with an axe to cut down the top of the tree, cut down the top of the tree. Um, the thing fell in the river. I pulled it out. I pressed kind of 20 or 30 duplicates of this plant, because if you collected it, then you might as well collect lots of duplicates. Collected everything else that was on the tree. By this time, it was getting dark. 
So we ended up having to walk back to the car, crossing the river several times, which was starting to go into flood um, mm-hmm. in the dark, back to the car with no headlamps. And I was not the most popular person on that <laughs> trip, but it was a great Passiflora. It was fantastic. We named it as Passiflora McDougaliana, which is um, a play on the fact that it's a big liana. And John McDougal, who was a colleague, um, worked on Passiflora's. Lovely. So it was really fun. It was really fun. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, Okay, so I'm just going to move on to um, uh, a really key issue, really, for for all of us. And you you just sort of alluded to it. But but, but plants are are obviously so vital to our world. Um, um, So how do we encourage the next generation of botanists? I I think it's important for us to actually encourage the next generation of naturalists. So people who actually look at nature as a whole. And of course, if you look at nature as a whole, you have to look at plants as well. And I mean, one of the problems with with conservation at the moment is it's very focused on on big, big furry things, although plants are starting to get a bit of a look Mm -hmm. in, which I think is really, really good. But I think things like Botanical University Challenge, things like, um, you know, some of the work that the Linnaean Society is doing um, with with um, the explorers uh, and the museum is doing through the explorers conference and looking at under underrepresented groups and just thinking about ensuring that plants are part of the curriculum farther down into into um, into education as well because although there are no botany departments anymore really that doesn't mean botany's disappeared no i think just by calling it plant science is you know that's fair enough but <laughs> But I think it's ensuring that that organismal side gets gets kept as well, Um, because we have lots of plant science departments which are entirely molecular and and people would could say those were botanists. Right. But actually, I think we need to keep botany as that broad church of people who who study everything from kind of, you know, checklists of nature reserves of plants to pollination to kind of um, phylogenetics to mechanisms of how cells work to mechanisms how gene works to mechanisms of, of microRNA because because that's all botany and mm-hmm. it's all it's all part of how plants make their livings in a world that contains lots and lots of other organisms so I think I think by by emphasizing the the integral nature of plants and also including them as almost as examples in sort of some of the some of the kind of primary school and secondary school curriculum, I think it, it would help us to ensure that, that that plants stay there at the center of center of the study of our world, because they're, you know, they are they are very important. And I, w- I was surprised that there weren't more, you know, any plant molecular biologists in in the cohort of the Royal Society fellows that I was admitted with. I was very surprised. Yeah. But um, but there weren't. Yeah. Well, what you say there about education at the primary school level and, um, and so on, I know there are groups like the Science and Plants for, for Schools group who are, are really yeah, working fantastic. with the Royal Society of Biology and, and, and look, because plants can be used as examples throughout the curriculum. Um, and the Natural History GS, GCSE, the Natural History, we all yes, need I was to, going to ask you about. We that. all need to be sure that the Natural History GCSE, the museum was very, the museum and the Linnaean Society were both very involved in thinking about that and thinking about the, the curriculum for that. But we need to just keep our eye on that and make sure that 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 the plant that 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 plants are definitely part of that because plants are of course a total part of natural history yes i mean you know natural natural history without plants what is it it's nothing yeah you know? Yes, yes, I've had some discussions about that with, with, the, with the with the group, and I know the consultation is is going on now. I think so. Everyone mm-hmm. has a chance, I think, to to make an input. But you're absolutely right. In in our discussions, we were making the point that you know plants must be there, and whole plants, you know, the the whole plant system, um, yeah. and not just the sort of um, uh, lower level. Not just not just molecular mechanisms, because molecular mechanisms are studied in labs, right? But plants do live their lives outdoors. Yes, with yes other well, I've plants. always 
I've always you know. found in my teaching and in fact in, in meetings and, and conferences and anything that you, you must have plants in the room. I, ideally, you go out into the field. But even I remember we did it. We did a, a conference at Reading on that. We called it the Big Botany Challenge, which was very much about plants in, 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 in school education. And we had my colleague Alistair Cullum had just kind of filled the room with plants. And we had we were able to talk about the stories of the plants and, and, and so on and it makes a massive difference. So if classrooms, for example, can have you know if teachers can be brave enough and educated enough to have plants in their um in their classrooms i think that can make a big difference as well as the school grounds and so on yeah and that i think contact. The word, yeah that word you said stories is important as well because because science science is nothing more than a story told in a particular way you know and and it's all about the narrative and and i think by making those kind of very compelling narratives that aren't boring and dull um we can go a long way towards making plants as exciting as animals. Yes, we, we have to avoid the boring and dull stories, which often get there because, you know, the stories are fantastic. The plant stories and the, the, the plants yeah. and people stories are, are, are absolutely. Um, so I, I teach a, I teach a, I teach for my my colleague, um, Syrian Sumner at UCL. She does a, a evolutionary behavior course every year. And so I teach one of her lectures about plant behavior. And the students are always blown away with the fact that about the things that plants do that, yes. that we don't think of as behavior because they just behave. Plants behave. I mean, all organisms behave. Linnaeus was wrong. Yes, you was. know, Linnaeus was wrong. Let's face it. And um, and and it's just that they do it at a very different time scale yeah. than we do. And so. And, and we don't think of our behavior. I mean, I was trying to explain to the students that, you know, you put your hand on a hot on a hot hot plate and you jerk it away and you think of that as a behavior right but it's not it's a chemical signal yes you know just yes. just like you know and andrew leach said something super interesting the other day at a, at a Linnaean society lecture he said that um that animals interact with their or their environment through development so they often interact with their environment through development whereas plants interact with their environment through chemistry yeah. And I thought that was a really interesting way yes. to think about that. Yeah. You know, and to think about. And so maybe we should be thinking about about ensuring that 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 plants get into chemistry curricula as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I've always. Yeah. I mean, I, it wasn't me. I'm sure that said it. But I've always, you know, plants are basically chemistry. You know, plant, you know, but, they're, well, they're, organisms are basically chemistry. Yes, but, of but, yeah. They. But plants really do. I mean, they you know, the work that the work that um, that um that they do from the Max Planck Institute in um, in Jena, you know, where they transplant. To, they've shown that tobaccos kind of if, if one plant is eaten by caterpillars, it ups its jasminate and emits um, mm. pheromones and the other plants then up their jasminates, you know, so it's like they're communicating yes. with each other through Absolutely. chemical signals in the air. Yeah. It's extraordinary. Yeah. But I think grazing grass, grass is being being grazed. There's something similar with that with cumarin mm -hmm. and, and, and so on, I, I, I yeah. think. OK, so I'm going, anyway. to slip in another, I'm going to slip in another question here, um, sure. uh, which is pretty basic. And, and I've heard you answer it before, but I think just just for now. So so how did you get into botany? Oh, well, botany found me as opposed to me finding botany, I think, is the short answer to that, is I wanted to take I, when I went to university, I went to university in the US. And so that means you don't have to have decided what you want to do before you go. You just go to university. Right. And then you figure out what's happening. And I thought I might want to study French. Right. So that was great. So I, so everybody who was thinking about doing a humanities type subject had to take it. Everybody had to take at least one science class or one arts class every term. So in my first term at university, I thought, um, OK, I want to take marine biology. Yeah, that'd be really fun because I grew up in New Mexico where there's no beach. And I thought this would be great. So I went to sign up for marine biology and it was full. So I thought, what can I do where I can be outside a lot of the time? Because I grew up kind of hiking and, and mm -hmm. being outdoors and there was field botany. So I took this field botany course and we went out in the desert every weekend. We went out in the desert with microscopes in these kind of little kind of we had these kind of cases where there were two dissecting microscopes and then the whole thing flipped out and then there were two little desks. And so we'd sit on the ground with these dissecting microscopes in the desert Wonderful. and just key out plants and figure out what plants were and look at plants and 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 i thought man this is great you know i'm going to do this and what's amazing about it is that, that what i've ended up doing in botany is exactly the same skill set as linguistics it's all about 
knowing, you know, yes. knowing, you know, having this recall memory and being able to remember stuff and being able to translate things and being able to kind of pattern recognize. And, you know, it's it's just the same skill set. Mm-hmm. And I'm so lucky I found it. I'm so lucky I found it, you know, that it found me rather, you know, because um, but all those weekends in the desert were just fantastic. And I always thought I wanted to work in the desert. I always was conv- sure that I wanted to work in the desert until I went to the tropics for the first time. <laughs> and then again, you know, the tropics yeah. found me as opposed to me finding the tropics, you know. Yes. Well, that reminds me. about. So that. for me, for me, an important message for people studying anything is is is. Don't don't waste opportunities. Don't don't just let let things happen that you you're not sure about because they may be the thing that completely changes your the course of your life. Because yeah. that certainly happened to me. Yeah, yeah, excellent. I remember a BSBI talk that Paul Ashton gave a few years back, um, and he was talking about um, the next generation of botanists. And one of the things he said was take the students to inspiring places, and that's clearly. <laughs> what got you um the desert and the, and the tropics um and, yeah. and 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 when i talk to um I, at reading i talk to um teacher trainees um it's previously been biologists but last time i spoke also to the chemists and the physicists and i talk about plants and i think it's good to be able to tell those different disciplines that they can you know plants can be um, fascinating and, and, and important as, as exemplars of, of, of what they teach well, as well. We've, we've a, mentioned chemistry, but physics as well. Well, there's an extraordinary Arts. paper which I use in my plant behavior lectures. Have you seen this paper? It's just the most amazing thing. It was published in PNAS a couple of years ago, and it's about Drosera leaves. And it's about how Drosera, you know, most leaf, most leaf movement is by oxen gradients. But the Drosser leaves don't move by oxen gradients. What they are is a deformable material because of different differing cell size. And, and it is, and what they've done is they've used the mechanical properties of Drosser leaves to um, to think about um, making deformable and reformable materials for use in places like high radiation environments or in or deep sea environments where you can't go and re reposition things easily because it's too dangerous it was so cool and it's all physics it's all physics yeah, yeah. nothing to do with chemistry it's so interesting because i always thought oh well yeah those leaves kind of they move because of because of these orcs and gradients the same way that all leaves move but no completely different so it makes you think about you know all that stuff about movement you know is it all driven by turgor pressure or orcs and gradients you know maybe maybe some of it is this other this other yeah, thing yeah. It's very cool. Yeah. yeah, it's a bit like flower color, isn't it? Some of it's chemistry pigments, but 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 a lot of it is is the physics of the you know the the work that that Beverly Glover's done at Cambridge. Oh yeah, the, the these, sort of diffraction yeah. and stuff. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lovely. Okay. Yeah. Well, we could well, go very on. Very good, on. Jonathan. It's nice to talk to you. There's and more. Then... There's one more. Oh, there's more. One more. Oh, okay. One more. Yes. This okay, is the one secret more. one. It's not a secret one. It's about Botanical University Challenge. Um, not surprisingly, we started in 2016 with five teams in the job role at, at, at Q. Last year online, we had 18 teams. For 2023, we're we're hoping for for more than 20. So we've grown. Arguably, it was a tough nut to crack. Um, so the question is, if Botanical University Challenge was a plant or a seed, what would it be? Oh, it'd be Selenum americanum, the world's weediest plant, the one that goes everywhere and ev- with everyone. <laughs> Fantastic. That's that's just wonderful. Thank you so much, Sandy. It's been all right. Oh, Jonathan, it's nice to talk to you. you. And I'm really looking forward to seeing about what happens with how many teams you get and, you know, all that's that right. other stuff. And, and, and we also have. Um, of course, the live finals in Nottingham in, in July. Well, it's been super talking, Joy. Thank you again and, and, okay. and see you soon. All right. Take see care. you soon, Jonathan. Bye. Bye.